As we prepare to hear God's word to us this day, let us pray together. Gracious God, you are with us when we gather to worship you. For that, we are both awestruck and gracious, grateful. We ask that you would help us to hear you, and in that hearing, to become good listeners, and in that listening, to become obedient, even to the living word, Jesus our Lord, in whose name we pray. Amen. This is the last week on our Parts of the Worship series, uh, Worship Service series. Uh, We've been talking about what we do in worship and why we do it when we do it. So this is the last week. We're going to be focusing today particularly on the charge, but also the benediction, those things that come at the very end of our worship service. The scripture text that has given shape to our our series has been Isaiah chapter 6, and I'm going to be reading today from verses 1 through 9a of that text. But because it's also Pentecost Sunday, we'll also be hearing that story, the the story of the birth of the church at Pentecost from Acts chapter 1 and chapter 2, little segments of that. Just to, as I said to the children, Pentecost is a Jewish holiday or Jewish celebration that goes goes back to way before the church began, and it uh, it happens 50 days after Passover, which is why they get the name Pentecost, uh, and it commemorates the giving of the law of Moses on Mount Sinai. So now hear the word of the Lord, first of all from Isaiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 9a. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lofty, And the hem of his robe filled the temple. Seraphs were in attendance above him. Each had six wings. With two they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and with two they flew. And one called to another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. The pivots on the threshold shook at the voices of those who called, and the house filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. Yet my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphs flew to me, holding a live coal that had been taken from the altar with a pair of tongs. The seraph touched my mouth with it and said, Now that this has touched your lips, your guilt has departed, and your sin is blotted out. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go for us? And I said, Here am I, send me. Then he said, Go, and say this to the people. And now I now am reading from Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and chapter 2, verses 1 through 4. Jesus said this to his disciples just prior to his ascension. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. When the day of Pentecost had come, they were all gathered together in one place, and suddenly from heaven there came a sound like the rush of a violent wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Divided tongues as a fire appeared among them, and a tongue rested on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other languages as the Spirit gave them ability. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I would imagine that uh, many of us have had the experience sometime in our life of of attending some sort of spiritual event um, or a conference or a retreat in which we were profoundly moved or in which we felt that we had had a genuine encounter with God that would change us forever. And then we've returned to our everyday lives, and that incredible experience faded. 
while we know that we really did have a powerful, life-changing moment in the routine of our lives, in the midst of all of the real-world responsibilities that we have, that stirring, heartwarming sense of the reality of the presence of God begins to cool. <coughs> I think it's probably a little bit like the experience of being brand new parents. You know how they are. They're just <coughs> almost giddy with delight at the arrival of their first child. And then about four weeks after that blessed event, <coughs> they are living in the reality of what it means with the, the sleepless nights and, and maybe a, a colicky baby and, and dirty diapers and an unbelievably reduced social life. And a dawning awareness that they have entered a lifelong commitment that will demand more from them than they think they can give. Well, if anyone ever had a profound experience of the presence of God. It was the prophet Isaiah in the temple. It was the disciples of Jesus on Pentecost Day. Things happened to them that we can hardly even imagine. <coughs> there were foundations shaking, there were heavenly visions, there was a roaring wind, there were tongues of fire, whatever exactly that might mean. Things that they could never forget, no matter how busy and complicated their lives became. But the point of those experiences was not just a flashy and frightening encounter that, that would be remembered and be recounted by them for a long time. The point was not that Isaiah and the disciples would feel the warm glow of the presence of God in their lives, kind of like that warm glow of, of holding a brand new baby. The point of those experiences was what they led to. And what they led to was ascending out into the world as witnesses for God, as witnesses for Jesus. They were sent out into the world for the sake of the world. And when we gather for worship in the presence of God, we, like, like Isaiah and like the disciples, may, may experience profound wonder and awe. We may experience gratitude for God's grace and forgiveness toward us. We may hear a, a deeply personal word from scripture or, or from the sermon. And we may respond with thankful offerings of ourselves and our, our substance. That's the flow of our worship. But it doesn't stop there. We are sent out into the world with the blessing of God, the benediction. And we are sent out with the charge to be witnesses to Christ, witnesses to God's goodness and grace in everything that we say and in everything that we do. We don't, we don't stay here. We don't just bask in the beauty of worship or in the, the good feelings we get from the, the fellowship with people in this place. And we don't just simply leave at the end of the service either. We are sent out with a purpose. We are sent out with a commission. We're sent out into the mundane and overscheduled reality in which we live there to be witnesses for Christ. Now there are many ways, of course, of, of being witnesses for Christ. And some of them are effective and full of grace and full of redemption, and some of them are not. 
I imagine that most of us have cringed at one time or another when some hate-filled group calls itself Christian. We are embarrassed and maybe, maybe angry when such groups, for example, show up at military funerals toting signs that state God hates homosexuals, except the language is way more graphic and way more offensive than that. We know that such actions do not witness to the Jesus of the Bible, nor do they further the growth of his church. Such actions are not what we are sent out to do, and we know that. But we may not know what we are sent out to do. We may not have a sense of what it means for us to be witnesses to Christ or for Christ in our world, in our, in our workplaces, and in our, in our schools, or in our, in our play places, in, our, in any place in our neighborhoods. We may not know what that means. I've just finished reading a book called The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert. In this book, Rosaria Champagne Butterfield tells the story of how she came to Christian faith from, from skepticism and hostility toward the faith. She was a professor of English at Syracuse University, and she was a very left-wing person who might make some of us a little bit uncomfortable. She was an ardent feminist, a lesbian, and she wrote a critique in the local newspaper of the Promise Keepers organization. So this was a while ago that this happened. And she received a ton of mail in response to her article. Hate mail and fan mail. She had two large Xerox boxes sitting on her desk in her office, one for fan mail and one for hate mail. She also got a letter from a conservative local Presbyterian pastor who was also the kind of person that some of us might feel uncomfortable around. But it was a letter that she could not classify as either hate mail or fan mail. She said this of it. It was a kind and inquiring letter. It encouraged me to explore the kind of questions that I admire. He didn't argue with my article. He asked me to explore and defend the presuppositions that undergirded it. The letter invited me to call its author to discuss these ideas more fully. It was the kindest letter of opposition that I had ever received. Well, after a week or so, she called the pastor and had a really nice chat with him on the phone and was invited to dinner at his home. She took him up on his offer, and thus began a real and probably quite unlikely friendship with him and his wife. She says this about that time. Even though these Christians and I were very different, they seemed to know that I wasn't a blank slate, that I had values and opinions too, and they talked with me in a way that didn't make me feel erased. They did something at that meal that has a long Christian history, but has been functionally lost in too many Christian homes. They invited the stranger in. Not to scapegoat me, but to listen and to learn and to dialogue. During that meal, they did not share the gospel with me. After our meal, they did not invite me to church. When the evening ended and the pastor said he wanted to stay in touch, I knew that it was truly safe to accept his open hand. It would be more than two years before Rosaria would ever set foot in a church. Prior to that, she says, it would have been too threatening, too weird, too much. So the pastor was willing to bring the church to me. 
They gave me the room and the safety I needed, and I opened up to them. I let them know who I was and what I valued. I invited them into my home and into my world. They met my friends, came to my dinner parties, saw me function in my real life. They made themselves safe enough for me to do this. One thing that really struck me about their character during these years was how unselfish they were. I observed that they fed and housed and counseled countless people from all walks of life. I saw how wide the door to their home and the door to their hearts opened. Well, eventually, because of the witness of their lives, both in word and in deed, Rosaria became a Christian. And she is now extending that same kind of welcome and openness and hospitality to others. Well, I'm pretty sure that we are not not all sent out to do exactly what that pastor and his wife did. Not all of us have gifts for that kind of witness. But we do each have gifts that we can use to impact our world for Christ. Simply relating with grace and compassion to those with whom we disagree is the beginning of a profound witness. I think that we all can ask, who are the strangers in my world to whom I can relate with the love of Jesus? What foreign language, as it were, might I learn to speak, as did the disciples on Pentecost? What are the needs that I see in my neighbors or in my work colleagues, and what could I do to meet those needs? Can I mow a lawn or babysit? Can I bring in a meal when there is sickness or when there is grief? Can I invite my neighbors, the churched, and the unchurched, and even those of different faiths to come for dinner simply to enjoy their company? Can I treat everyone with respect and care, even when I disagree with them? I read an article in the most recent issue of Christianity Today, which which quoted the late pastor Chuck Smith, who was the founder of Calvary Calvary Chapel, a very large evangelical church in California. And in it, Pastor Smith said this, If you have come to a strong personal conviction on one side of a doctrinal issue, please grant me the privilege of first seeing how it has helped you to become more Christ-like in your nature. And then we will judge whether we need to come to the same persuasion. Let me read that one more time. If you have come to a strong personal conviction on one side of a doctrinal issue, please grant us the privilege of first seeing how it has helped you become more Christ-like in your nature, and then we will judge whether we need to come to the same persuasion. What a great way to evaluate our opinions and our spending and our values and our actions. Is Christ made more visible in them? As Christians, we are sent out into the world every day as ambassadors of Christ. In us, People see him, or they just see us doing our own thing. We represent him to people we meet. And even if people don't know that we are Christians, the way we treat them, the way we behave in our lives, impacts the world for good or not. There's a contemporary Christian song that proclaims, You're the only Jesus some will ever see. And then it goes on to ask, 
If not in you, I wonder where they will see the one who really cares. We are sent out week after week to live out the worship that we have just completed. Let's go do it. Amen. That's what you're supposed to do. You're supposed to agree, right? <laughs>